Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Valerie Brown, and it is a great honor and privilege to welcome you to Climate, Consciousness, and Community Summit. So we have two things that we're going to focus on for the next 15 minutes or so. The first is who are we? Who's in the room? Who will be sharing this journey of learning and discovery? The second focus for this morning, for the next 50 minutes, is what actually brought you here? What might be meaningful? What intention or aspiration might you be holding for today or for the entire summit? I feel like I've prepared for everything except this, <laughs> this moment. Um, this is a wonderful moment. Thank you uh, so much for coming in support of our precious planet, Mother Earth, our home. We are all linked in such extraordinary ways. We've been given so many extraordinary gifts. And why? Why are we given this precious planet? Why are we given this gift of life? And I think it's because we are asked to be stewards of the earth. We were given all of these things, intelligence, um, in order to take care of the, the gift of the earth that, that we've been given. And unfortunately, um, we haven't done our best. To read to you our mission statement, very important, I think, describes a little bit about who we are, and then I'll have a special blessing. Welcome home. At the end of a long day, the trolley stops and you find a spiritual home at First Church, where we are called to the ministry of reconciliation. We celebrate our human family's diversity of race, ethnicity, age, faith history, economic status, education, physical and mental ability, sexual orientation and gender identification. We affirm that all people are created in the image of God and as beloved children of God are worthy of God's grace. We recognize that there are differences among us, but believe that we can love alike even though we may not think alike. We invite all people to join us in our faith journey towards greater love, understanding, and mutual respect. So looking to the East, we unite our hearts and minds, and we look to the East as the dawn, as the new day, and this is where we get, where each one of you, each one of you came with a vision. So you are honoring your vision to the East. Take a minute in your heart. Think of that vision. And in the East, we send our blessings and our gratitude up on the winged ones. And in the tradition of the Iroquois Thanksgiving address, we give thanks to those winged ones, all those from the tiniest insect to the largest condor. In this time of tragic beauty, we remember what we have done to our neighbors to fuel and finance the lifestyles that others of us enjoy, but that have now led to the destitution and the squalor of the planet. So how do we become resilient and adaptive and hopeful and compassionate to ourselves, to our neighbors, to our particular bioregion and the wider global community. It's to find a way to coordinate the inner Camino and the outer Camino. And with that coordination, with that dance between the two, we can live into climate catastrophe. So continuing with the theme of ritual, we'd like to present a kata. This is a scarf that has been blessed. When I was 
last in Dharamsala in the north of India. Um, I purchased these, um, these scarves from vendors on the street. Uh, for probably 20 years or more, I've been going back and forth to Dharamsala, to uh, the, the Dalai Lama's temple and monastery. And so I want to, ex first of all, begin by expressing a kind of cultural humility, cultural sensitivity, that uh, when, uh, when I speak of other people and other people's culture. But with that great sense of humility, I'd like to present the kata. Thank you, everyone. Um, it has definitely been my pleasure, my great joy to be with Transition Time Media for 10 years. <laughs> and uh, um, so I look forward to uh, continuing that uh, for as long as I, it is my own possible. So here we are in 2019, when the majority of scientists are sounding a clarion call to stop extracting, transporting, and most importantly, burning fossil fuels. The symptoms are many, whether you look to the oceans, the air, the soil, other species, or ourselves. The fossil fuel industry's growth at any cost is truly like a cancerous growth, a cancerous growth that we must stop. We were told that the most effective messengers are us. So here I am, ready to translate all of this for Southeastern PA. Where to begin, right? Um, the first thing that comes to mind, shockingly enough, is that we need to equip our leaders to lead on climate. It means we need to help the folks who currently hold office, and of course every candidate wanting to run, wanting, wanting to get into office. They aren't necessarily experts in climate science, nor know what needs to change. And as environmentalists, we're often frustrated with our leaders for not leading on climate. I've been there, I've been angry. But we need to have some compassion for the people in politics. Because we're, the process was very inclusive over many years, and um, it was not easy to, to do. But it came out with really clear 17 very distinct goals and targets under those goals, so it was very practical. So that was, and the whole world signed on, so this is a unanimous to-do list for all. So that's a breakthrough right there. And that comes down to the, the community level because you say, we do this goal, we're doing this, we meet this target, and you sort of have benchmarks to work with. And what's coming up now is that there needs to be more, now that we've broken it apart and we see the distinctions really clearly, it's time to bring them together and look at the gestalt. And right. say, who do we need to be between and around these goals, and how are these goals interdependent on each other, are we interdependent on each other, how do we bring this together into our larger Said, listen, it's not the oil companies. 
that's causing a threat to the rainforest. It's really our doing. It's our habits. It's our relationship to the earth. There was a time not that long ago when everyone could agree that pollution was a bad thing. We stopped acid rain. We stopped aerosols and the ozone. We can't agree anymore because we've actually stepped a little too close to the oil and gas companies, and they're fighting back. They were the first ones to point out in the 60s that what they did was going to add CO2 to the atmosphere, and what the CO2 in the atmosphere was going to do was going to raise temperatures, and there's going to be results from that. They said this in the 1960s, their own scientists. Since the 1960s, they've been on a dedicated and very targeted propaganda campaign to not disprove climate science, because you can't disprove facts, but to create just enough mud in the water that people look around and they say, well, he said this and she said that, so yeah, I'm just gonna sit back and, and, and not worry about it. So what I'm gonna try and do here is remind everyone that these conversations, this will work for me, there we go. Every conversation you have with someone who disagrees with you, and they can be your aunt, your uncle, or some stranger on the street, um, has to be yes and. Because nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, Unless they're flat out lying, which many politicians do, they have access to the best science in the world, and yet they'll tell you things that are untrue. But for the most part, most part folks are just misinformed. So it's always um, In fact, Rhonda was with me when I went to Standing Rock a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago, um, and that was very transformative for me. Uh, so I wanted to start there. Uh, when I was at uh, Standing Rock, I heard the Lakota prophecy, a thousand-year-old Lakota prophecy of the black snake that someday a black snake would rise up out of the ground and move across the land, mm -hmm. causing great sorrow and destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, and they identified, finally, after a thousand years, that the black snake were the oil and gas pipelines in the fossil fuel industry. And the prophecy goes on to say that if the people of the world don't unite to defeat the black snake, then the world will end. And that's where we are right now. Uh, will we be able to unite and defeat the black snake? So when we left Sandy Rock, the elders said to us, go home and look for the black snake where you live. Mm -hmm. So when I got back to Pennsylvania, I realized that the black snake here is fracking. So uh, I went up to Dimmick at the suggestion of, of Rodney here, who knew about a, a tour, and saw how um, fracking was affecting the rural communities up there and poisoning the water and so on. Um, and, you know, I started to realize uh, the lies about gas. You know, we've been told that gas is a good fossil fuel, that gas is our friend. Um, and yeah, the methane is the main ingredient in natural gas is leaking uh, from the extraction sites and also the um, infrastructure. And that makes it even more deadly and more of a cause of climate change than, than carbons, burning carbons. When we began our work to try to stop this pipeline, um, it was a lot of meeting with elected officials. It was a lot of um, giving public presentations and educating the community. And we were really inspired by Lancaster Against Pipeline to delve more into direct action, more into protest. Um, but really wanting to do that in a way that reflected our community and figuring out who our community is. Our community is a lot of mothers and fathers and grandparents and um, people who just live and work here and are concerned about public safety and about the environment. But one of the things I love about this is just after these um, mama bear actions took place, we were all gathered in Fugit Middle School in Chester County for um, a presentation on a citizen's risk assessment. It was a project we did, we raised about $60,000 and we did an assessment of the risk of the pipeline and found that it's actually really bad. And so uh, Senator Deniman, who's a senator in Chester County, was he was standing up and he was, you know, sort of introducing and everything. He said, you know, and, and, and oh, we have some members of the Mama Bear Brigade in the room today. And, and Abby Weiser stood up and 300 people in that room, which included elected officials and county officials and municipal officials and like all these people gave her a standing ovation, wow. right? And, and I, as that was happening, like I just got tears in my eyes, like here we are, we're doing this crazy thing. Like we don't know what people are gonna think. Maybe they're gonna hate us. And then we get to, <laughs> And they can give her a standing ovation. We have had our successes. Uh, and uh, for example, the pipeline projects is running at this point two or two and a half years behind schedule. It's still going. And we don't know how it will end. But um, I think uh, our, we've been fairly effective in at least slowing it down. And 
very effective in changing public opinion, at least in this area. <coughs> and um, we've replaced some elected officials. We plan to replace some more this fall. And we, and we finally begun to get the governor's attention, which we couldn't for a long time. So um, I would say we're OK. Um, and one of the things, so we could still lose this. People ask me, how likely are you to really to be able to shut this thing down? At first I said 10%, and then I said 30%. And I don't know, we're, we're not at 50%, but we're, we've been getting closer, but on the other hand, the pipeline has been getting closer to completion. So I don't know how that ends, but I do know one thing. If somebody tries to do this again with a new pipeline in this area, it's just not going to happen because things have changed. So, um, um, to us, it was about being a community and standing for justice when we realize and acknowledge that our elected officials have allowed their laws to become unethical and have allowed the laws to be for the sake of the elite few rather than for the sake of. We, the many. And so that in unethical um, direction and approach to governance is what we're standing up against. It's not just the fossil fuel industry, it's everywhere. We see it in the prison system, in education, in healthcare, that it's about the elite few protecting themselves and their friends and their own money rather than caring about what's best for human beings. And that's what we need to reverse. Do what works in your community. Find what values you share and what's going to pull your community together. And if we all do that where we live, if we all locally come together where we are and have this resistance, that's a power that the elite few who are ruling us right now can't stand against. And that's the direction I think we need to go. Stopping the pipelines is a perfect example of the first way of bringing about the great turning. We have to stop the destruction. So whether we are stopping the destruction by acts of civil disobedience, or stopping the destruction through legislative acts, or stopping the destruction by writing petitions, whether we are helping homeless people by feeding them or by creating new housing policies, all of those things fall under the first category of stopping the destruction, ameliorating the pain, looking at it systemically and looking at it individually. Those, that's the first category. And remember, in these three categories, all are equally important. The second category is what we heard from Judy Wick, building the institutions that we would like to see for the future, whether it's creating technological changes like solar power, whether it's building food co-ops, uh, housing co-ops, worker co-ops, producer co-ops, new forms of the economy, new forms of technology, new kinds of communities, the world that we would like to see happen, building that right now, that's the second form of bringing about the great turning. And the third one is, I think, the way you started on day one here, which is about a change in consciousness. Change, the change in consciousness from thinking that we're individuals to that we're together. The change in consciousness from power over to power with. The change in consciousness from competition to cooperation. and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one, as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. We are one in our wish that they become so, and now our minds are one. And now our minds are one.
least I know some of us, you know, don't think of a positive future. We don't envision a positive future that there's a time after this darkness when, you know, we have a more beautiful world that's more just, cleaner, less suffering. That there are still birds and whales. And that's the future we want, you know, that's the future we, we long for in our hearts. So that was, um, that was a beautiful exercise. And I know I'll carry that you know, with me when I feel really, uh, when I feel despair for the world. I'll think about those who are waiting for us in the future. Our children's children who are waiting there and cheering us on. I'm going to pass something. There's enough for each of you to have one. What do you have in your hands? Maybe it's a seed. There's a tree in there. There's a whole universe in there. But guess where else there's a whole universe? It's inside of us. There's a whole universe inside of us. So I handed you the seed, and my hope was, is it possible, can we create a circle? Of course. Bring our seeds. So you have a seed, and what we're going to do is we're going to go around. And what I would like you to do is hold the seed, and I would like you to think about what it is you received from this conference. What have you received? that has touched your inner seed, that has touched your heart, that has touched your soul. And how will you bring that out into the world? <laughs>